Here we go. Hello there, Terence McGuana here, and today I'm in action movie heaven as I'm joined by card-carrying 1980s action legend that is Steve Lambert. Although you may not be aware of this man's name, you will surely be familiar with his incredible body of work in films such as Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, The Domination, Critters, Friday the 13th Part 5, Blind Fury, Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, Inner Space, Bestseller, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Rambo 3, Total Recall, Time Cop, The Dragon, The Bruce Lee Story, the list goes on and on. Steve has recently written his own book detailing his life and illustrious career, Stephen Lambert, From the Streets of Brooklyn to the Halls of Hollywood. And I will leave a link in the description where you can get your own copy. Good afternoon, Steve. And I must say, I am so honored to have you chat with me about your amazing story today. Oh, God bless you, parents. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I do appreciate it. And for the audience out there, thank you very much for watching us. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy our little interview out here. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again, the things that uh, we've missed. But uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for having me, parents. An absolute honor to have you here, Steve. And, uh, you know, you've uh, just looking at the... I mean, as you know, I've been watching a lot of the a lot of your work recently. I still still yet to to get more familiar with your story and your book, but I've been watching so much of your work lately. I did a whole series on Canon films and rewatched a lot of the the, the classic ninja films that you that you you had such a big hand in. I'm just absolutely gobsmacked by your work. Team effort. Team effort. No, I know. Yeah, it's a collaborative effort. But you know, looking at some of the some of the things you've done and those, especially Revenge of the Ninja. Honestly, I have to I have to applaud you for that. The the work in that film is just absolutely sensational. And considering the budgets to those movies, in comparison to say a big Hollywood production like Die Hard Two, for example. I mean, Die Hard Two cost something in the region of like seventy five million dollars to make, whereas Ninja Three: The Domination was two million dollars to make. And honestly, I would watch that over that any day. It's just one of the most exciting, fun films that I can honestly hope for. And I thank you for that. My pleasure. I, I'm so grateful. I can't tell you how much those words touch me. You know, wow. uh, I'm, a, I'm a person that's just, uh, you know, very grounded. And uh, I don't take this stuff uh, to heart. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. And all my friends out there, I never call them fans. I don't like that word. Um, all my friends out there who uh, have sent me so many uh, hundreds of thousands of emails, I had no idea that people were going to enjoy uh, the three ninja films that I did and the work that I put into it and that Sam Furstenberg put into it uh, with our uh, DPs uh, and our actors. Uh, um, and our whole cast and crew, uh, you know, one thing about Canon Films, uh, they always chose the right people in most cases uh, behind the scenes, uh, the production end. Uh, um, you know, they were always hungry, um, I found, and they always cared. Uh, and you need that in a film. And they always understood. And uh, most of them had the desire as I had the desire, especially, you know, the main people I had to talk to, like the DP and the director, you know, uh, and, and uh, most of the actors. And yeah. Then, if you have them with you and uh, if they see your fantasies, your creations, uh, and they uh, trust you, uh, you go far. You know, those three ninja pictures were, were my three really, you know, first films. Uh, right. Coordinated and I did second unit on. And it was wow. a chance of a lifetime, you know, Menachem Golan, Sam Furstenberg, David Walmark. Uh, they gave me uh, a chance that I never had throughout my entire career. The closest that came uh, was uh, with Indiana Jones, you know, between wow. the ninjas and Indiana Jones. When you're working with directors and producers, they don't give you those liberties. You know, you have to mind your P's and Q's. Yeah. With, you know, with Sam Furstenberg and with uh, Steven Spielberg, 
they were my two favorite directors because they let me work. Um, they trusted me and they believed in me and they saw what I could do, you know, uh, on, on um, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, um, uh, Steven Spielberg had no idea what we were going to do there with that train sequence. Right. No idea. You know, uh, I went there with the, with the stunt coordinator, Vic Armstrong, and it was a collaborative effort uh, right. with Vic to do that sequence. And, uh, you know, I had a vision, you know, some of my favorite actors, you know, uh, which I portray a lot, uh, even though I do hard physical stuff. You know, all my whole performance in those ninja pictures, there's Charlie Chaplin in there. There's Buster Keaton there, in there. There's Harold Lloyd in there. You know? Bruce Lee. Definitely yeah. Bruce Lee. There, you know, but, uh, you know, those three first guys that I mentioned, you know, they always did long sequences. I could never figure out why stunt people never did long sequences because it kept the audience going. Yeah. And that's what I brought them, Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, was part of the ninja, you know, long sequences, whether it was fighting or comedy, you know, I just changed the body language to be exciting and physical, hard and dramatic, you know, I followed them. But in yeah, his, you know, Bruce Lee. There's a lot of Bruce Lee. You know, definitely that performance as far as body language and acting a action. You know, I uh, I'm a people watcher, and uh, I had never been taught by Bruce Lee when I first started. But somewhere in my mind, dissected everything Bruce Lee did and try to understand what he did and somehow I grasped some things um, before I understood what I was doing, body language. Some of my heroes, Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, dancing, you know, yeah. language movement, you know, I of was course. always enthralled with, with, with those guys, you know, the performance, you know, that Gene Kelly, you know, one of the best physical stuntmen I ever saw in my life. I wanted to be like him. So my performance, you know, the ninja was a lot like him also. You know, I took people, you never create something new. You know, you always take something from somebody and bring it to yourself and change it and mold it, right? To make everybody think it's new. Yeah. Guys, the, all these guys that I mentioned, they're the originals, you know. Douglas Fairbanks Jr., senior, you know, those yeah. guys, you know, and, and we take, I took things from them and I molded it into my way. And and you guys out there, don't ever be afraid to do that because a lot of guys you work with, stunt guys, when you first start, they'll tell you to do something, right? But there is, there, there's no... There's no way where you cannot do any something in between, right? So yeah. do your stuff in between. As long as you do what they tell you, right? You can put your stuff in, right? A lot of stunt guys don't have that nerve, and right? Have that understanding. And when I first started, you know, that's what I did, and that's I how I got so much work. People would, you know, tell me to do something, right? Well, I would make it bigger or I would mold it into something else, you know, and uh, sometimes I would tell them, sometimes I wouldn't. They'd have to see it on film. And uh, they were impressed of my physical ability, which I owe to martial arts, Kung Fu. Um, my well, that's, that was, that was what was, was Douglas. That was what was, yes. Douglas, sorry. My yeah. master, my teacher who taught me Martial arts was uh, Sifu Douglas Wong, Silam Kung Fu White Lotus, Five Animal Styles. And uh, <laughs> wow. I was a punk kid from Brooklyn. And uh, I was very small and uh, uh, never backed down from a fight. Always got my ass beat in Brooklyn, New York. Um, right. 
you would hit me, I would come at you. You would hit me, I would come at you again. You know, I, I, until you finally got tired sometimes and you'd give up. And, but uh, I came uh, to uh, California, you know, and I explain that in the book how I found martial arts and how I found uh, something that I did well, finally. I had no idea. And martial arts brought me into the movie business. And uh, the stuntmen of the day, when I first started, they were all cowboys and gangsters. As I explained in the book, you know, uh, people like me, uh, the first six martial artists that came into the stunt world, uh, young teenage types, uh, was James Liu, Mike Vendrell, Rick Avery, Albert Leong, and uh, myself, first five. Excuse me. Uh, right. And Jeff Amata. And Jeff Amata. Six. Right? Those first six all came in. Now, we were all, we all looked different, right? I was thin. I looked like a junior high school kid. Mike Vendrell was over six foot, big stocky. The only one that didn't look like a teenager was Al Leon. <laughs> Albert Leon. But we all were different types, body structures. And the stunt guys of the day laughed at us what we did they didn't believe in martial arts they believed in cowboy fighting gangster fighting that's it you know right. i mean we literally had to uh bust our ass to 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 get them you know to to hire us because the th even though we knew how to do what they did you know right. cowboy fighting because there's there's many different styles of fighting right and yeah different styles of fighting you know Martial arts, boxing, cowboy fighting, street fighting, you know, you know that type of stuff, you know. Uh, and, and you use different things in the motion picture business, depending on what type of scene of it is it. If it's a, a street scene and you're a bum, you know, and you get into a fight, well, you've got to convert yourself, you know. Instead of being a master martial artist, you've got to be a sloppy, you know, hobo, you know. So you have to know how to interchange, but they didn't understand, you know, the, the, so, of the day and they laughed at us. And I explained that in the book. I was, doing, yeah. uh, I was doing a picture called, um, uh, they call me Bruce. And I was asked to bring, uh, uh the stunt coordinator and knew I had, uh, you know, 30, 40 different types of weapons from Japanese to Chinese, from Korean to Filipino. And I brought them on the set and there were, he hired uh, 15, 20 cowboys because it was a cowboy bar fight sequence. They call me Bruce. And uh, uh, I was doubling a female actress who turns into a ninja uh, in a telephone booth and fights the cowboys, right? <laughs> and the director wanted to pick the weapons, you know? So I brought the weapons and I put them down on the, uh, the stage floor and all the stunt guy cowboys came over and they were picking up, picking up the weapons and laughing at them. You know, they pick up a three-sectional staff. You know, oh, you know this goddamn stick is broken. You know, and right. uh, they never saw anything like that. You know, uh, uh, you know, and they would make fun of the weapons, and they never, you know, these. And they were cop stunt cowboys. Yeah, John Wayne guys. Yeah, like, John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And when we started rehearsing the moves, they were scared to death when I started moving all the weapons, playing the ninja, you know? And I explained these things in the book, how funny it was and the details and the things that happened, you know? But uh, uh, they slowly had to start hiring us because the TV writers started, because of Bruce Lee uh, right. and, uh, and uh, other martial art films that started to come up in the 70s. Yes. Yeah. Writing martial arts in it. And they knew nothing about martial artists, these stunt coordinators of the day. You know, there were very few martial artists, Gene LaBelle, but he was a judo guy. Right? right. He wasn't a stunt coordinator. You know, Bill Ryasaki, you know, uh, um, uh, guys like that, you know, uh, uh, but they were old guys. And uh, uh, they weren't stunt guys. They were martial artists and they were actors, per se. You know? Right. 
So they had no choice but to hire so the guys I mentioned, James Liu, Rick, Mike Vendrill, Jeff Amada, you know, Albert Leong, myself. You know, that's how we got all those jobs, you know, they had oh, yeah. for us. And that's how we got the experience. The so, the, so the first that's the it. first ninja, the first ninja that you played on screen was a female ninja. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. No, 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 it won't be that won't be the first time, though. <laughs> There's more ninjas to come. And in those days, you were able to get away with it. These yeah. days, you, can't, you know. But uh, in those days, you were able to get away with it. And uh, the times I did double females, I ha I've always had a, a slim, you know, body. You know, my waist at the time was 28, you know, and my wow. chest 38. You know, uh, people used to f freak out about my figure. I had a, I had a woman's slim figure. But <laughs> I was able to double women where most stunt guys wouldn't, you know. Uh, so I was very lucky. So... When stunt guys, stunt coordinators hire me to double a woman, you know, well, you know, I'm not the boss. You're going to hire me. I'm going to do your job. I'm going to do the job, you know. Do when you I, feel, oh, sorry. When I, when I had to, like, with Lucinda Dickey, you know, that was at the time, Canon Films, it was on location. They wouldn't let me bring anybody from Los Angeles. They flatly refused because of the money right? Either get somebody here, right? Well, I got somebody here. The first scene, there just wasn't a performance, you know? Right. I tried in rehearsals two or three girls. I ended up with this one that I was satisfied with. She did do a little bit the graveyard. She did a little fight sequence in the graveyard, right? Right. I still wasn't satisfied, right? So I said, thank you very much. And, and I proceeded. Everything there except a little scene in the graveyard was me. You know, I, uh, I always had an idea in my head, performance-wise and body language, and I couldn't get it. Um, I couldn't get it from yeah. uh, That's why, you know, people ask me why. I mean, I could sit here and watch Revenge of the Ninja, The Domination, and American Ninja, I can sit here and you'll wind up punching me in the face because you'll get sick of me saying, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. You know, yeah. one of the reasons why I did that, you know, because I didn't have the money. I couldn't get the performance out of the guy I hired, you know, um, things like that. So, you know, Revenge of the Ninja, I mean, I played 150 characters in there. Wow. Yeah. Ninja, oh nondescript people. Because well, see, for those reasons, because I cared so much and because I wanted that performance. And at the time, the only stunt guys, see, there was no groups in any other city or state, only California. There were a few stunt guys in New York, maybe in Texas, but nobody respected them. The guys were, if you didn't live in California, Los Angeles, you weren't considered a qualified stuntman, right? So it was very okay. difficult to find guys in different cities and different states back then and before, you know? So uh, I had no choice um, but to uh, either play the character. You know, I would hire you know, 15 ninjas at one time to fight Shokazuki, you know, <laughs> three or four of them weren't giving me the performance. So right. I had to put a wardrobe and stick myself in there many, many, many times. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, and it was also a blessing, you know, uh, it, it taught me a lot uh, in many ways, um, performance wise, Action, acting wise, body language wise, camera wise, understanding lenses. You know, uh, when uh, whenever you're performing, and this is for all you new stunt people out there. Whenever you're performing, when you have an opportunity, you know, once you work out your sequence, and the directors and the uh, DP, the cameraman, looking through that lens, right? You want to look through the lens too, right? because. 
where it might be too small, it might be too tight, it might be too wide, you know, you're going in a different direction at one time. Uh, you want to work that into your head. You want to play that camera. And you want to say, okay, you're going to stay there. So I have to create my scene, turn myself around so you could see. I don't want to lose the move where most stunt coordinators will lose the move. I just want to turn myself around, right? in that sequence so the camera could see what I want them to see. And that's important. And that comes from martial arts, you know, stances, shuffles, different types of movements, you know, dancing, yeah. you know, you mentioned yeah. Bruce Lee, you know, Bruce Lee was a supreme, a master of performance. When you were doing a sequence, or when he was doing a sequence, right? He knew where camera was all the time. So in the midst, if he had to move an inch for you to see, you're the camera for you to see more, right? He moved and, and he showed camera, which entails he shows the audience, right? And it's a nonstop fluid circle, you know, shuffles, stances, understanding footwork and different positions and how to get into them. Fighting, kata, movie fighting, dance wise, you know, how to get from one area to another in a smooth way, in an entertaining way, in a strong way you know, in a, in a way that uh, doesn't stop the flow. That's what Bruce Lee was a master on. And that's what I always insisted on. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I talk too much about one specific thing. So shut me off. Um, <laughs> oh, we're, we're, we're soulmates on that one. <laughs> Cause that, that's what I'm like. I just don't know when to stop myself, Steve. But uh, what I was going to ask you as well is that, um, Ninja 3, The Domination, right? It's got to be one of my favourite canon films, right? It's such an exciting movie. How involved were you in the creative process with that? And what were canon films like to work for? Yeah, you know, first of all, let's start with canon films. Canon films was always a challenge and a lesson um, and very hard work. But... And, and I owe Canon a lot because I did low budgets. I started out with low budgets and I did high budgets. And if you do enough low budget films and you understand, and if you're taught the old fashioned way from some of your mentors, you could get things um, out of a, a low budget film that cost you a lot of money in a high budget film. Right. And, like I said before, Hannon always gave me that opportunity. Uh, in a way, they had no choice, <laughs> you know. <because laughs> you know, so we were working each other from both ends. Uh, Menachem, uh, I love Menachem. You know, a lot of people hated him. A lot of people didn't understand him. He was a rock. Uh, he was a bull to most people. Uh, and when I say most people, 99.9 .9 people, but somehow, some way, um, we loved each other. I understood, uh, maybe because I came from Brooklyn, New York, and I didn't take his crap in a respectful way. You know, hmm. a lot of times he would yell at somebody, you know, and I would turn to him. I said, Menachem, you better calm down. You're going to have a heart attack. And everybody would turn white and I would laugh. And he'd say, Steve, you crazy, you crazy. <laughs> you know, that's what he called my nickname. He, his nickname for me was Crazy Man. Right? <laughs> um, and we loved each other. Yeah, he was a pussycat. And he used that strong, domineering personality um, uh, uh, to, to convince people, uh, you know, Sam Furstenberg, David Woolmark, um, they all had many conversations with him. 
and he was very hard nosed. But when it came to me, he was always very respectful. And people would say to me, you know, how could you like that man? I said, the guy is a pussycat. He's great. You just got to understand him and you have to show him that you're not afraid of him. And that's what everybody was uh, was doing was, you know, whenever he talked to him or they had to deal with him, they were scared to death of him. You know, you know, I had a meeting with him. He called me up to his office in Hollywood one time. Um, and uh, I, I walked into his office. He had his feet uh, up, uh, up uh, on his um, on his desk and he was smoking a cigar. And I walked in and uh, I uh, I sat down and I said, to Menachem, Menachem, you got to have Canon films. You got to, you must respect Canon films. And he goes, what, what, what do you mean, Steve? What do you mean? I said, you must get your feet off your desk. Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I wasn't scared of him, you know, I, I I thought he was very humorous. I mean, I tell a story in the book, Revenge of the Ninja, all day. Shokazuki was working on, I mean, Shokazuki, uh, Sam Furstenberg was working on an interior dialogue. Three quarters of the day, Menachem flew in and he came on the set. And it was a day where I was very rarely free, so I was watching. Uh, and he came on the set. And it was the very first day, and I guess I was there because Menachem came on the set, and he wanted to talk to me. And you, you'll, I won't tell you why he wanted to talk to me. You'll find him. You'll find it. I mean, there are stories in there. So many stories about these ninja pictures. Working oh. in films is like no other. But uh, uh, he uh, came on the set, and mind you, this this scene that Sam Furstenberg was working on was uh, was a, a full day. So Menachem came on, the three quarters of the, the, the scene was finished. Menachem came on, uh, he walked on the set and he said hi to everybody and he told Sam Furstenberg to sit down. And uh, Sam Furstenberg sat down and uh, he started directing. Now, he had no idea what Sam Furstenberg directed <laughs> or what the scene was all about. <laughs> And, and he directed the scene for about an hour, and then he gave it back to Sam Furstenberg. <laughs> and Sam Furstenberg goes, uh, okay, let's everybody go back to before uh, uh, Menachem on the set, <laughs> you know? And Menachem wasted three quarters of the day, you know? Oh. And that was Menachem. I mean, it, it's precious, you know? And I talk about that, you know, on, uh, uh, in the book. You know, very funny moments. Very funny moments. Oh, oh, that's a that's a great story. That yeah, is such a. Hey, you want to read great stories? I mean, I I just mentioned to you, uh, uh why Menachem Golan wanted to talk to me. Um, Sam Furstenberg and uh, David Walmark. David Walmark was the producer, production manager. Very smart man. Very dear friend. Also. Um, uh, they played a practical joke on me. And I'm not going to tell you the practical of the joke, but it got very serious. Oh, no. The joke became very serious. And uh, I'll tell you who was involved. Shokazuki, Sam Furstenberg, David Walmart, um, and, um, and um, Menachem's daughter. And that's all I'm going to say. And uh, the stories start from the ground to you take a step, you take another step, you take, I mean, this is, it's, it starts out funny. Right. And then it to be uh, um, uncomfortable. Then it gets to be uh, serious. Then it gets to be outrageous. Then it gets that all hell breaks loose. Right. And it, I, I take you through the experience. You'll laugh your ass off. Okay. And uh, the audience out there, get the book. It's called Steve Lambert, From the Streets of Brooklyn to the Halls of Hollywood. You can yep. get it on Amazon.com. Yeah. it's and, and, you know, there's just bursting with stories about uh, your career. But the, the one one thing was, I was... What, what was the next uh, question after Menachem and Canyon? Well, what I, what I was really asking about, because I'm such a dork for Ninja 3, the domination, right? It is my go-to... 
it's like it's it's like an antidepressant in that film to be honest i mean it's, it's i read that first of all you're talking about the action i remember your your other two questions now um you know when when canon gave me a script those three ninja pictures mainly the script i would open it up and all the dialogue would would be in there and then there would be blank pages right there'd be more dialogue and there'd be blank pages and when i first picked up the first script the revenge of the ninja I, I I looked at it. They're all blank pages, and I go, oh, "There must be, you know, you gave me a wrong script. They're blank pages, you know, it's a mistake. Something happened with the copier." And they said, mm -hmm. "No, all the scripts are like that." So I went over to Sam Furstenberg, you know, and David Walmart knocked on their door in the office, and I said, "They're blank pages here. Why?" They go, "That's where the action is. You got to write all the action." <laughs> oh wow! And you know, I stunt coordinated. You know, and I learned from stunt coordinators. That's never done. That's never done. You know, the the writer writes something basic, and you get an idea from it. You know, and then you work your way, you work your imagination and your fantasies into it. So mm -hmm. they gave me blank pages. All the three ninja scripts I did were like that. Wow. You know, which gave me a. That's why I said the opportunities. I had never had an opportunity to this day like I had with Canon Films because they gave me 50 years of experience in three movies. Wow, you know, I that's took incredible. I learned from the guys from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, the old fashioned way and brought it to those ninja pictures. Because so surprised. I didn't, have, I didn't have the money for equipment and for people, you know, and for great locations and for great, you know, I had to condense the ideas and uh, get it in a way where if I didn't do it, it would have never been uh, in the film. That's amazing. So really, we've got you to thank that these are tremendously exciting action pictures. No, I mean, I know that I know there's a collaborative medium, right? You've got Sam Furstenberg and all the actors, Michael Dudikoff, Steve James. Lucinda Dickey, Sho Kazuki, right? They're amazing, talented people. But going from a blank piece of paper to having ninjas on the golf course, right? <laughs> I, was kid, I was a kid in the candy store, and I wasn't in the prime. I wasn't even in the prime of my ability yet. Wow, that's uh, incredible, I Steve. Pictures. So you know, and you know, thanks to people like David Walmart and Sam Furstenberg. You know, they just said, you know, the world is your ocean, man. Go wow. out. And I would, uh, uh, they would bring me to the location and they would ask me, do you like this location? Because if I saw another location, you know, 30 feet or something, or I had an idea, they would move it for me. That's how much it's teamwork, you know. Yeah. A wonderful team. So I would... Uh, they would take me to a location. I would put something together in my head on paper, right? Uh, then I would bring Sam there, right? And I would explain it to Sam. And then Sam and I would fit where he needed the actors, he needed the dialogue, or when he needed what was in the script. Okay, we could put it here, we could put it there, we could put it there, right? Then if we're talking about Revenge of the Ninja or, or well, Revenge of the Ninja, because domination was different. Then, then I would bring Shokazuki. And then, because Shokazuki had wonderful ideas too. And yeah. what made Shokazuki so great was I had an actor who did live shows before he became an actor. And if you do live shows, you know, it's wonderful because you make the audience believe it. And you have to do things for the audience. One dimension. Yeah. You know, right there. So... I knew he was talented. Never met him before, never saw his work, but I knew if he did live shows because he used to do live shows at Magic Mountain. Right. A lot of people don't know that. And even he doesn't discuss it. Oh, okay. He started doing live shows. When he came here, he started doing live shows, Magic Mountain. But then I would right. take show Suki there, and he would do the same thing because he would bring his ideas. Well, instead of this being here, I like that idea, but... I, I want to do this. I want to save this. Can you switch it around? I go, sure. Yeah. Switch it around, right. 
and what made what made the performance between the Silver Mask Ninja and Shokuzuki so wonderful was because he did live shows. And when you do live shows, you have to action act body language, right? And yeah. that's why we work so good together is, is I trusted him, he trusted me, and I was a martial artist and uh, you know he knew it. He was told by Sam First to bring David Walmart. He didn't see it at first. You know, uh, you know, the first things that I did with his eyes upon it were stunts, you know? Yeah. And then after I did the stunt or before I did the stunt, I would always revert to martial arts. The reason why I could do this is because of martial arts, which was the truth. So we became closer because whatever I did stunt wise, because he didn't see me perform martial arts yet. Right. right. I can't. <clears throat> I came there six weeks before he did. Sam Furstenberg and I and David Walmart. He wasn't there yet. So, yeah. so I would always, I would take, I would always, whenever I did stunts, because I think the first week and a half, all I did was stunts until we got into some sort of fighting, right? So I would always revert into, into martial arts. So that drew us closer. You know, Revenge of the Ninja, I mean, we were so close. Um, I tell a lot of stories about Shokuzuki, how wonderful he was on on uh, on uh, Revenge of the Ninja, and how naive and how innocent he was. Yeah, it was the de delight. Um, after that, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> well, I was going to go, speaking of uh, Shokuzuki because I understand that he wasn't too pleased with Ninja Three: The Domination, that uh, the, the main character Christy was a female ninja. I know that she was possessed by the evil ninja right, in the movie, which, but he, he had some criticism about it. Is that, can well, you enlighten us on that? Yeah, what, what happened was, after Revenge of the Ninja, it was such a big hit. Two million dollar picture, like you said. If that, it was such a yeah. big hit. Um, and, uh, and Menachem uh, so enjoyed show's work. Um, that, uh, that, um, excuse me, got my dog here. <laughs> it wires. Um, Ninja dog. Yeah. Uh, that he promised him that he was going to be a star. Let's hold up for one second. Okay. No, take your time. No problem. Hi everybody in the chat. Hi Ice Lord. Hi Jack's vlogs. Uh, I was just, uh, enjoying chatting with this amazing man here. Uh, not got a chance to even respond to you hi retro hawk how he's doing <laughs> just we ignore talking, we were talking about uh shokuzuki and not being happy with uh, the ninja three um uh, uh uh revenge of ninja was such a big hit and uh shokuzuki and menachem got so close during that picture and uh you know this was uh uh canon's first major film you know um and Menachem promised uh, Shokuzuki uh, to do the uh, second film, the second ninja film. And then all of a sudden he got an idea in his head that uh, <laughs> a female ninja, a female ninja. And, uh, you know, Sam Furstenberg, David Walmart, myself, we had no part of this. You know, it wasn't in our conversation. This was all Menachem's idea. <laughs> so he decided to make you know, the second one, which was really the third one, uh, but the domination, um, a female ninja. And uh, Shokuzuki found out and he went ballistic. He went into the office and they got into a big war. And uh, um, uh, Menachem told him that he was going to play, you know, a ninja that comes in and tries to help, you know. Yeah. The star, you know, everybody's going to watch you, but he wouldn't have it. He didn't like the idea. Um, you know, they weren't uh, the best of friends, uh, which was Lucinda Dickey and Shokuzuki. Wow. For many reasons, you know, now Shokuzuki uh, um, came onto the set. He finally decided to do the film. He wasn't going to do it at first, right? But uh, you know, there was a lot to 
uh, Shokazuki uh, and that character in the domination. Um, so he took the film and he came onto the set um, very hard nosed. Uh, and when I say hard nosed, I had no idea this was happening to this extent, but he came on the set with a resentment. So the first right. thing, you know, I, I was working weeks and weeks before he came onto the set because he wasn't the star, you know, it was loose in the dicky, you know. So I, I was looking forward to seeing him because we were very, very close, you know. Uh, we became, I mean, we were like blood brothers on Revenge of the Ninja. So I was looking forward to seeing him and and because uh, I hadn't seen him in months and months and months. And uh, he came down the set, like I said, very hard nosed. And uh, the minute I saw him on the set, I ran over to him and I went to hug him and he wanted no part of it. Uh -huh. And I, I, I backed off and I was stunned. And, I looked at Sam Furstenberg and, you know, Sam Furstenberg get, kind of gave me one of these, like, I'll tell you later. This was our cues. I'll tell you, I'll explain later. And I said, it's good to see you. And he's very standoffish. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, nothing's the matter, you know. And it, it, very, it very much hurt me, you know. I didn't understand what was happening. Well, make a long story short, I went over to Sam Furstenberg and he explained it to me. And uh, I said, what, what are we, what, what is he? He goes, you're acting, the, he's acting the same way towards me, right? Mm. Resentful. And I said, you had nothing to do with this circumstance. I had nothing to do with circumstance. You know, why aren't we friends? Well, you know, we got through the domination. It was, we laughed, we played a little bit, but it was nothing like Revenge of the Ninja. Our, our uh, friendship was more of an acquaintance um, working relationship on the domination, unfortunately. Oh, and that's a after shame. That, after that, he decided because Menachem was going to make him do, have him do another picture, the star, right? Yeah. But Shokazuki resented it so much as he went off and did other films. Oh, that's a that's a real that's 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 sad. It must have must have been really heartbreaking. Did did that cause difficulty in doing the work? Well, in any way, it, 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 let me just say this: it was nothing like revenge, uh, because when it came to me and him, it, like I said, it, unfortunately, it was very hard nose. And um, yeah, you know, I haven't seen him. I've seen him once since the domination, and that was probably a year after. The domination. Never saw him again. You know. Oh. You know. It was. It wasn't uh, uh, when 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 it came to him because uh, you know we had no choice. We had to deal with each other because I was doubling Lucinda and I was the stunt coordinator. But now it was a different uh, circumstance. He didn't have as much power as he did in Revenge of the Ninja because he was the co-star, right? Um, yeah. So when it came to decisions, um, he had less power, which made him more upset. Uh, meaning in the design or what he wanted for Lucinda Dickey, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this was Lucinda Dickey's decision and Sam Furstenberg's decision. Totally different thing. And uh, I was involved in it because, you know, I was more or less third, the third string, you know, it was always Sam Furstenberg, you know, in this case, the domination, Lucinda Dickey and myself, you know, right. no, nothing went through anybody else except us. You know, first it went through us and it went through them. That's how much, you know, Menachem and Sam Furstenberg gave me, you know, but it was a different situation now with Sam, with uh, Shokazuki. And Lucinda Dickey, he wasn't in control of the picture. So he resented that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, Shokazuki, Japanese, traditional Japanese, shut down. they shut down. They don't get verbal. They just shut I... down. And he would shut down. And uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, in the interior abandoned house, I had a very difficult time with him because... I had to double him 
and I had a double play Lucinda Dickey, right? And I had a very short time to get that whole scene. And Lucinda wanted it one way and he wanted it another way. And it was all action. And I had to use what I had, you know, if you notice, yeah. you know, like I had a, uh, a washing machine, I threw down the stairs, you know, and Shokazuki dove out of the way. You know where I got that washing machine? It was in, yeah. in the abandoned house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Shokazuki wanted certain things when it came to me. And I had to explain to him, I have to use what I have. I have no money to get anything else. You know, you know the a scene where he explodes through the uh, uh, the floor. That was yeah. me, right? And and he didn't want that. And I said, that's gonna look. People are gonna love that. And he did. And he and I designed that before um, he even came up. And Lucinda Dickey okayed it, and Sam Thurstonberg okayed it. Well. When I said that scene has to stay in, you know, if you want to change, you have to go to Lucinda Dickey and you have to go to Sam Furstenberg. He yeah. wasn't happy about that. Can imagine. And, and I have to do that because they're my bosses. Those are the only bosses I have on the set. So I have to, it's a chain of command out of respect. Exactly. And, it's, that's so, and he didn't understand that. So, you know, when it came to Shokazuki and the domination, we just got through that. Well, it's, it's a real shame, Steve. You know, uh, considering, you know, how well you gelled on uh, Revenge of the Ninja and everything. But uh, let's let's move on, move along from there. I understand that you doubled Michael Dudikoff in American Ninja. That Michael Dudikoff is a big favourite of my partners, right? She absolutely loves Michael Dudikoff. And I, I'm a huge fan. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the late actor Steve James. What can you tell us about working with him? And was it true that Michael Dudikoff and him were not on the best of terms during that shoot? <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Uh, a lot of resentment, not on Steve James, on Michael Dudikoff, who is a wonderful actor, you know, a, 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 a friends of sort. Um, um, We've had a, a, a wonderful relationship at times, up and down relationship. Right. Off and I, but uh, Steve James, let's start with Steve James, a wonderful actor, a wonderful man, a wonderful team player, uh, wonderful humor, wonderful talent. Uh, uh, you know, in the Philippines, we hung out a lot. Uh, we became great friends. Um, a very down to earth person. Uh, I will never forget. I, I will never forget his face. You know that scene uh, uh, with him in, in, the, uh, in the cheap shooting? As yeah. he's up, you know, that whole <laughs> scene with him. That wasn't in the film. I explained, <laughs> I explained that in the book. I don't want to say too much, but I explained that. It wasn't in the film. You know, uh, Steve James went to he was just going to be part of the American army going in, you know, period. You know, yeah. we were going to feature him, but that wasn't in the film. But he, before he came to me, he came to Sam first and goes, Sam, I, I need something. I want something big. I want to enter big, you know, um, uh, and there's nothing there. I just appear with a bunch of, you know, other military, you know, and I fight and I shoot people. That's it, you know. So Sam came to me and said, uh, I need an added sequence. You know, I want a great entrance for Steve James. So I went and, 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 and there's some tears to this um, uh, story, which I don't want to tell you too much uh, until you read the book. You, you Terrence, on our next interview. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I went over to Steve and I go, Steve, what are you thinking? We had a meeting. And he says, I, I just, I want to shoot a big gun and I want to shoot a lot of people. And I said, hmm. Right? So I said, okay, I'll get back to you. So a couple of days later, I drew up the sequence, uh, just as you saw, you know, him coming up those stairs 
And a lot of people don't realize was I was the driver of that Jeep. All right. Yeah. I was, I wouldn't trust anybody. I said, you just shoot and don't worry. You're not going to fall over. You're not going to get hurt, you know, because I'm the driver, Steve. So he was fully confident. And when I explained that sequence to him, the shine on his face, because as you know by now, I'm a detailer. So, you know, I took him the whole th through the whole sequence physically, you know, from point A to point Z. And there was a, just a big shit-eating grin on his face, and he loved it. Well, that's the way we shot the sequence, and he loved it, and he was so thankful. And, and he was like a kid in the candy store. But there were others that were very upset. And I'm not going to tell you that story until you ask me on our next interview. Okay. There's a continuance to this story. And you asked me a question. You said you heard that him and Steve mm -hmm. James, Michael Dudikoff and Steve James, um, uh, they weren't the best of friend, friends. And I said, you're absolutely right. Well, I will explain. I explain to you uh, why they worked and what happened. In the, and I'm involved. Very much so. Right? And... Uh, Completely innocent, so is Steve James, but you'll have to read it. But the story bounces from American Ninja to, uh, I forgot the name of the picture. Uh, Avenging the Force? Uh, uh, no, uh, I did with Steve James and David Carradine, the next picture in the Philippines. I stood in the Philippines. David oh. Carradine did an army movie, uh, Behind Enemy Lines, POW Escapes. Oh, POW, yeah. That story continues into that movie. Even though Michael Dudikoff didn't have anything to, you have to read the book. Right, okay. Oh. A very fascinating story. And a lot, of, a, a lot of stories you will read and a lot of conversation you will hear from people like Michael, that they were the best of friends. And I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep till I read that book now. <laughs> trying to hurt Michael, or I'm just telling you the truth. They became yes. friends. I'll tell yeah. you this. Later on, they became big friends. But for a while, they weren't best friends. And on uh, American Ninja, they weren't best friends. And now you have to read behind. You have to read American Ninja chapter and behind Enemy Lines chapter to get the. <sighs> the full understanding of what happened because it gets well, it, it 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 carries on because uh um it, it's it, it's it's a wonderful story it's a wonderful conversation when you're reading it but uh they weren't the best of friends uh it was uh, a competition unfortunately she don't mean to interrupt you, Steve, but see the that sequence you, you explained with the Jeep and the machine gun yes. uh, and Steve James. That's one of my favourite sequences in the whole film, to be honest. I think Steve James was right to add it there. It just it just adds this kind of... There is an element of comedy to it because it's, you get the impression that... Uh, was it Curtis Jackson, the character? He's quite of a comedy character. He's a bit of a comic relief character. Well, you know, there's a lot of comedic... Uh, Parts to this yeah. uh, to this movie, and and Sam Furstenberg always, uh, you know, he favored a lot of uh, humor. Yeah, That's, that was one thing about Sam. Uh, he liked a, a mixture of humor and seriousness. You know, Sam Sam's a very talented guy, and immensely, and, and um, you know, part of the char charm is a lot of humor, and conversation is a lot of humor. And uh, and um, and he had it, you know. Uh, Steve was uh, a very funny guy. Yeah, I, th it's, I think one of the greatest losses to action cinema is how we never they never really pushed this guy to be in a lead. I know that he did one film with Sam Furstenberg, Riverbend, which is good. It's a good film. It needs needs a proper release, to be honest. But yeah, yeah he he should have been he should have been right there, out in front. I I would say. He didn't have, you have to have a guy, okay? 
I tell a story in the book and I try to explain this to a lot of actors, martial art actors, be martial art actors, right? You have to understand and have enough sense to hire and take the right things. Um, you have to hire the right people. That's important. When you get in that position, you know, God bless Michael Dudikoff, you know, he didn't hire the right people. After American Ninja One, you know, it, it started getting worse and worse. His film started getting worse. You have to hire people that care about you and your film and about right. your work and about the story. It means a lot. You so know? you mean like like agents? There's a, lot, and... there's a lot of martial artists. Be martial artists. And I won't mention names. But they've had so many chances and they've never gotten out of that realm because they you they they get the wrong scripts, they take the wrong scripts, they hire the wrong people, fight coordinator, stunt coordinator, director, um, DP, you know, script, you know, they mean a lot. And and even if they don't hire the right people. They don't have enough sense to try to make it better because they really yeah. don't care. And people, you know, that's why Michael's not doing movies anymore because he got so burnt out and people got so burnt out of him doing the same character all the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Shame he's talented. He's a good actor, uh, Michael yes. Dudikoff. Yes. He's wasted. And that's what I say about Steve James is he was – you know, he was he was always sort of the second supporting actor. He was a lot of the time, I think every time for every film that I've seen him in. And, uh, I'll and give you an example. <clears throat> uh, I did a movie called The Quest with Van Damme. And I've seen all, I'm a fan of Van Damme's. It's great. Like same. Great talent. Uh, great, uh, great uh, martial art actor. You know, it's a wonderful, easy way of doing things when it comes to acting. Uh, great talent, right? When I went, we knew each other, you know, before the quest, right? Uh, we both have hard heads, you know, we believe in what we believe. But uh, when I had my first meeting with him, you know, we were happy, we saw each other, uh, we shook hands, we sat down and I said, we, I told him, Jean-Claude, I said, this isn't going to be like uh, most of your other movies. You're going to do things that you never did before, meaning fight moves. People are tired of seeing you do the same thing all the time. Right? Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of stuff. So all through that, I tell some fantastic stories about the quest. Right. Uh, he fired me twice on the show. Then he called me an hour later, you know, um, telling me he was only kidding, you know, <laughs> you know, and because I understood, you know, we would bang heads all the time, you know, um, I bang heads because I care, because I know what's good, you know, if you have something good, I'll take it and I'll use it because I'm a team player, right? But so it be, isn't it? If, you're, if you're doing the same kick, the same punch in every movie. I'm not your guy. And all through that movie, we would have wars in discussions for hours. You know, uh, I, I tell a story in the book, you know, the end sequence um, uh, where he fights the lead bad guy. Uh, yeah. Where he throws 67 punches at one time. Okay. It took me two weeks. I started two weeks to convince him to do that. That scene wasn't in the movie. I said, nobody in movie history has thrown 67 punches. Yeah. At one time, right? He wanted to end it. You know that flying spin kick that he has in the movie? And the bad guy goes down? That's Yeah. He throws the flying spin kick, and the bad guy goes down, and then all the punches, the 67 punches, start. And then that's the end of the fight, right? 
He wanted it to end that kick. And I fought him for two weeks. I said, put it in the, the movie. I said, when you show it, because they always have a, a show piece before the right. film comes out to audience, right? If they don't applaud, take it out, right? So he kept it in and he did it. And he throws 67 crazy punches nonstop. You know, it's the yeah. best thing. The best thing. But I would, you know, all the fights he did with all the guys, I tell you stories. I mean, oh. you're going to laugh so hard when you read the stories of the quest. Right. Roger Moore's in that one as well, isn't he? One of my all-time favorite Bonds. The quest. Uh, he, he was wonderful. Wonderful actor, wonderful human being. Um, yeah, you know, he uh, laughed at me our first meeting. I said, I can't believe I'm working with James Bond. Uh, you want to teach me how to do a stunt, huh? <laughs> he was such a professional, so gracious to everybody, so easygoing, you know, because uh, um, it was a rough film. You know, working with Moisha is uh, the producer uh, is is rough. Um, uh, and it's all about your location as well. What location? Where did you shoot the quest? Is that in the Thailand? Philippines? In the Philippines. Philippines. Philippines, yeah, Manila, Philippines. Uh, but I tell you stories about that, you know. But he's a prince, nice guy, and like I told you before, I'm a people watcher. You know, uh, I just watch everybody and watch their personality, watch their man mannerisms, watch what they do, watch what they say. You know, what? That's how you get to know the real person. You know? Yeah, and he's just a real person, a real nice guy. Real yeah, nice guy. he always struck me as the consummate gentleman. You know, just not just because of his performances on screen, but I've seen countless interviews with Roger Moore, and he was always had a real sense of humor about himself, a lot of self-deprecating humor, which I like to emulate. Some people think that I'm trying to like uh, flagellate myself by making I fun of myself. Guys. I love your humor. I love off humor. Just most yeah. people don't understand it, you know. I mean, Vic Armstrong, you know, or in England in this case, Vic Armstrong. Yeah, F familiar Vic with him, legend. Andy Armstrong, I loved his humor. I, he would make me laugh all the time because it's very hard to make me laugh. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people misconstrue my personality. And uh, he just made, Vic Armstrong, you guys make me laugh all the time. Bullocks, bullocks, B <laughs> bollocks. What the hell does bullocks mean? And he, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's say a bullock. bollocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, just wonderful experiences, wonderful time. I love you guys, you and I. I think I, I think I'm gonna. We're gonna go for another thirty minutes. Is that all right, if, Steve? Yes. Yeah, yes. don't. You know, I mean, I know you've got some endurance, right? <laughs> I've seen it in action, but um, I'm I, an old man now. I'm 68 years old, going to be 69. Wow. Yep. You look younger than me. <laughs> I'm 43 yes. next month. Not inside. Inside, it takes its toll. You know, God bless for martial arts. Uh, I couldn't have, like I said before, couldn't have done the things. So agile, so flexible, timing. There's, there's five things you need to be a great athlete. Stuntman, baseball player, hockey player, basketball player, whatever. Dancer, whatever, right? Timing, coordination, distance, focus, and power of the mind. If you have those five things, you're a great athlete. And, and that's what I always believed in. And uh, I try to work out all the time still, not as much as I used to, you know, because no matter how much you keep in shape, it takes when you're as physical, because 95% of my work, my career is physical, was physical. Mm -hmm. And it takes its toll on you eventually, you know. That's an interesting point because Sophie, one of my, one of my good friends here on YouTube, she was wanting to ask you actually, what would you say is the worst injury you've sustained on a film shoot and how did that happen? Um, the worst injury? Uh, Probably off, off set, but on set, the worst injury. Let's see, probably on, uh, let's see, probably um, 
on uh, what was the movie with Michael J. Fox, James Wood? Oh, I love the hard way. Yeah, probably the hard way. I I cracked my shin. Um, probably that, and it hurt so bad. Remember the uh, remember I was playing the character on uh, the hard way. Uh, Nick Lang. Nick Lang. I was uh, I I was um, oh, what are the actors? The long haired guy that they were chasing. No, that was uh, another day, another day in paradise. Another day, another stakeout. Another stakeout. Yeah, yeah. With uh, with uh, Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus, right? Um, I was playing a character. I had a character part on that. Long hair. You wouldn't recognize me. And uh, Richard Dreyfus and uh, the other actor is chasing me. And uh, uh, third uh, third floor fire escape. Uh, they hired a I'm a guy's uh, Dublin Richard. The stunt guy is Dublin Richard Dreyfus. Um, uh, we do a double high fall. And when you do a double high fall, you're supposed to let go of the person. And he was from New York, so I didn't know. I trusted the stunt coordinator to hire the right person. Make a long story short, he held on to me all the, almost all the way down. And he caused my shin to hit the fire escape. Cracked my shin. Oh. And uh, it hit my head on the fire escape, too. You have to watch it sometime. Didn't hurt <laughs> Didn't hurt my head, but hurt my shin, and that was probably uh, the worst. Uh, worse than the, the, the worse than the American Ninja. Oh, sorry, continue. Sorry. No, I did. Uh, I'm Revenge of the Ninja. I hurt myself too, real bad. Hairline fracture in my neck. Uh, oh. Yeah, I did a. Uh, I fell through the abandoned house. Fell through two stories, two floors, and I had an airbag in the basement. And an airbag has two stages. Well, the DP convinced me to, to not put air on the top stage. Now, the top stage is what releases. Right. That stops you. The bottom stage is just like a raft. The air doesn't come out. Right? Right. So it's kind of like a cushion, the first stage. Now, in my head, I figured... Going through the two floors were going to slow me up because you hit breakaway wood, so you get slowed up, but it didn't. And, and I got caught on a real piece of wood, and uh, it made me fall. I landed on the mattress airbag because I released the first page because he was in the basement with a camera, and there was no space. If I had the entire airbag up, he couldn't see you know, me coming through the ceiling. Right. Basement, right. So I had to release the first stage. So when I came down, that real piece of wood threw me sideways and I came down on my neck and, uh, and, uh, cracked a vertebrae in my neck. Oh my goodness. I, I started that movie and that was third day into it. I started that movie. I came on that movie with a broken ankle with a cast. You read the, the book. I won't tell you how, but I had a broken ankle and 72 stitches and a broken wrist. Cast on my <laughs> 72 stitches and uh, cast on my ankle. That's how I started that movie. And I, I won't explain it. You have to read it. Unbelievable. Because there's one I've noticed. Um, and there's one that we mentioned before we went live. In, in American Ninja, there's a sequence where Michael Dudikoff's character, Joe Armstrong, escapes the army base so he can go on this date, right? Yes. And he uses a motorcycle to escape the base. And if you notice in the shot, the double, which is you, in fact, right? Yes. Uh, you bash your face on the front of the motorcycle when it lands, right? Well, and, uh, I, I, I won't tell you, I won't explain that whole scene. But this scene is in the book again, and it's very funny. You'll last your ass at a <laughs> butt off. But I had no intentions of doing that. I will tell you that. No intentions. <laughs> I'm an added motorcycle rider, but not a motorcycle jumper like that. Right. Before I did that, I, I did five-foot jumps, ten-foot jumps, little baby things. Yeah. Know, part of the fast riding and all that. 
I never did a jump like that. And I'm not a professional motorcycle, motocross, rider, right? Stunt rider, right? And that's the basic, right? But how how it came apart that scene at the very beginning, and how I was uh, pressured into doubling him, it's very funny. Because <laughs> I, I, I always half expect that you see Joe Armstrong in the next scene turn up for his date with a lovely bouquet of flowers and just this old blood all over his face. Like, oh, <laughs> that would be, that would be, that would, that would be hilarious. But if, um, yeah. if you notice, as soon as I hit my face, it cuts off right away. Yeah. I hit so hard. I hit so hard that my head slammed into the tank. Right. And it knocked the wind out of me. When I hit, the reason why it cuts so fast is I stopped the bike, right? I went, boom, and I got up and I was still riding, but the wind was knocked out of me. And I yeah. just biked to the side and I skipped and fell and held onto my side. And I'm going, oh, 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 oh. And, and, it- and first the bird comes r- running over me and I got blood dripping down. He goes, he goes, you all right? He goes, all right? I'm like, yeah, I just got to catch my breath, you know? And I'm going, where am I cut? You know, he goes, it's just a little cut. He goes, a little cut. He goes, did you, I go, did you get it? You know, and he goes, yeah. I go, did you print it? And he goes, yeah. And I go, that's all you're getting. <laughs> oh, and it's there forever. For all that pain and suffering, you know, as they say, pain is temporary, film is forever. It's right there. Right, See, 35 years right later. Shocks. I didn't have the right shocks on that bike. Mm. That bike was a street bike. So yeah. to do that on a street bike with no yeah. you know, proper shocks, you know, I hit hard. And I know yeah, it, it did, hard. Yeah, it did, it did look that way, but it wasn't the right. It wasn't like a motocross bike. So I just want to try and get as much out of you as, as possible here. But right. One of my all-time favorite action movies from the 1980s is Remo, The Adventure Begins, as it's called in the US, Remo and Armed and Dangerous, as it's called here in the UK, starring the late, great Fred Ward. And the most memorable scene is the fight on the Statue of Liberty, right? Especially the shot of Remo perched on the scaffolding that surrounded the statue at that time. I am fascinated to know more about that. Well, you know, I got a call. I was uh, two weeks before finishing American Ninja One. And I got a call from a second unit uh, director, stunt coordinator, Glenn Randall Jr., who's a very close friend of mine, cowboy guy, completely the opposite. Uh, he uh, comes from a very famous family called uh, the Randalls. He owned, right. uh, yeah, yeah, they owned uh, very famous ranches that all the cowboy pictures uh, and the uh, cowboy actors went to in the yeah. 40s, 50s. You know, that's how far back he goes, generations. Um, But uh, he called me up uh, and uh, offered me the picture. And I was ecstatic because, you know, doing three ninja pictures in a row, you know, I was getting a little tired. Like I said before, I wanted to spread my wings. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, at uh, my very beginnings, my first uh, four or five years. And I uh, wanted to spread my wings. So he ca- he told me about this movie, sent me the script. And uh, the first uh, stuntman to ever work on the Statue of Liberty, uh, to do stunts on it, uh, to this day, you know, yeah. hasn't happened. And uh, I, uh, I, I, was, I read it, and, and, and it did have martial arts in it. He talked to me, he says, I want, we need you, I need you to, come up with a new uh, martial art style called Sininju, right? Sininju, yes. I had to come up <laughs> with a new style. Ooh. Brilliant. You know, the whole Joel Gray thing, I ha- I taught Joel Gray. Right. And, uh, um, his performance, I was like a technical advisor with Joel Gray, and and uh, I was the fight coordinator on the show, and, and, uh, and, uh, I, I thought the script was fasc- you know, fascinating, and a chance of a lifetime. And it, it after, after years not being in New York, because I come from Brooklyn, New York, 
right? I left when I was 13. And so I was so excited. First time being back in New York. Uh, so I decided to do that picture. Now, Menachem Golan was really upset because uh, I told uh, David Walmark and Sam Furstenberg the very next day, and they were very unhappy, but they understood. They were great friends by then, and they wished me their best. But they told Menachem Golan because, you see, people, when you work for, for Canon Films, you're like a family. You become like a family. So if one leaves that is very, one of the closest to the family, they get kind of like very nervous. And Menachem was livid. And I ne I'll never forget this. I was in my hotel room at night and I got a call from Menachem. And he reamed me out. And I, I trying to convince me to stay. Yeah. Said, Menachem, I'll come back, but I want to do this film. Um, and I, he wouldn't listen to me, you know, you can't, you owe me, you know, I, I, I did so much for you. And I go, I know you did. And that was not him with his ego. I felt, you know, that was a friend trying to reach out to keep me there. Yeah. Uh, to keep me there because, you know, it, it was, he felt that I was a big part. Of it, you know, after Revenge of the Ninja, after uh, the Domination, after American Ninja One, you know, so yeah. understand. Um, is it the money? Is it this? Now, if I was smart enough, which I explained in the book, I would have did something completely different. But I wasn't a smart guy. I would have said, "Okay, you want me there? Make me a director in the next film. Uh, Make me a star," because. You know, I, I I I had that chance. That's how much. Yeah. Happened, right. I had that. That's chance. that's kind of the way Maraham would operate with with talent. He would give them things. He would give them a, a a movie to make, like Christopher Reeve on Street Smart. He gave him that movie as a sort of little bonus, so that he would play Superman again. So you were right to try and pull that one on him. Well done. I wasn't smart enough to do that. No. Right? I I didn't do that. Oh. I did that afterwards. Right. Ah. I wasn't smart enough to do that, right? So I explained to him, and he was livid. Anyway, we, we went, I wished him the best. He didn't wish me the best, but I knew he'd love me. And I said, I'll see you, you know, there are more shows. You're going to do more movies. I'll see you. No, you never work for me again. You hear mm. me? You hear me now? That's how we talked. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a real shame. But at but the end of the day, Remo. I did work for him again. Yeah. Yes, he did hire me again. <laughs> that must have been nice making up like that. He did seem like that sort of guy, like hot headed at first, but then he's like you said, he's a pussy cat. He's a pussy cat, and and you know he's a you know he's from Israel and the old you know the old ways, and uh, you know was very got brought up very spoiled, and uh, and uh, he was it was just him. You know, he was a god and he knew it. And I was I was probably uh you know one of very few that that he let speak to him that way. You know. Um uh I would uh, I would uh sometimes he would always be pouring in sweat, you know, and when he would be yelling at somebody, I would walk over and uh with a towel. <laughs> You know, and you know, and and you know, when I would do things like that, you know, I would try to break it because in the movie business, when you're working, you know, you, you want to keep on going. You have no time to argue. Somebody makes a mistake, never disagree. And whatever he did, that's the way you went, you know, unless it came to the action. And uh, you know, uh, uh, he let me do whatever I want. You know, uh, I think if you if you allow me to interject there, Steve, I think it's a testament to your talent as a stunt coordinator that Menachem Golan must have felt that you were a real part of the success of Canon because Ninja Ninja Three, and I've looked up the the take for these films, uh, Revenge of the Ninja Ninja Three, right? They were successful films. American Ninja was a box office hit, whereas like something, you know, it, it made like ten times its budget. 
at the box office. Well, that's that's a hat, right? Yes, uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, I love the guy, and I loved working for him. No, but I think I think you I think you were actually quite instrumental. And uh, you're a really important part to the success of Canon because after American Ninja, to be perfectly honest, the sequels don't hold up as well. They don't, they, they lack a lot of the sort of, there's a real spontaneity to Ninja 3, for example. You really don't know what you're going to get from one scene to the next. And I've watched thousands of films my whole life. And that one in particular it is just exciting. Yeah, right. uh, um, I, I'm very aware of that because, uh, you know, when I left American Ninja One, I talked to Sam Furstenberg and I talked to Menachem and I talked to David Wilmark. I talked to the powers and I said, let me give you a guy that I know that will care, that'll do the job. You know, he won't play the ninja, you know, but he'll give you all the ideas and he'll bring you people that will make the ninja look good. His name mm -hmm. was Mike Vendrell. In fact, Mike Vendrell, when you read the book, He's the reason why I did Revenge of the Ninja. He's the right. reason why I did because he had it before me, you know, uh, and that story is in the book. He decided not to take it and take a TV show. TV show can go for 10 years. Yeah. It only goes for three or four months, you know. Yeah, so it's he, more money potentially. You know, so I said, take Mike Vendrell. I said, Sam Furstenberg, you know Mike Vendrell, you know, but they wouldn't have it. And you got Mike Stone. And Mike Stone only cared for himself, you know. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I know that is because on American Ninja, I had the unfortunate circumstance to having to bring Mike Stone along. You know, I had to fire him too. Right. I fired Mike Stone. And there's a whole story. There's a whole <laughs> teasing me again. I had to put Mike Stone in his place after a dozen times because I will allow things because people don't understand. But when you don't understand and, and you keep on having chances, given chances, yeah, sense, you know, eventually it's got to stop. And, and you'll read America, the chapter on American Ninja one, and you understand what I'm talking about. And that was no, like, no, but I think I Menachem fired him. I had to say, either he goes or I go, and Menachem fired him. Yeah, and quite right. I, I didn't. Want, I try to explain to Mike Stone, he wouldn't have it. I try to explain to Dudikoff, you're gonna laugh your ass off on the things that happen when you read the book, because it's a progression. You know, you know, things start out one way. And sometimes you're surprised. Sometimes you have to show people. You know, there, there was a, a time, I will tell you this, I won't tell you all of it, and you'll laugh. There was a moment in the sequence with the truck, the army trucks at the beginning. Yes. You know, where he does all the stunts running on the truck and all that stuff. With the chain on the steering wheel, amazing. There was a time where I said, okay, Mike Stone, Richard Norton, I'm going to show you something, right? The stunt guy who was driving the truck was a great stunt man, one of the few in the Philippines. You drive the truck as fast as you can. You're going to look through that side mirror driving the truck, right? I want you to try to not have me catch up, right? And I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing on the truck. But you just continue it at that speed, right? So I did a rehearsal. And he turned the truck around. And he went back to A with Richard Norton and Mike Stone and Sam Furstenberg and David Warmark. And the DP was there. DP was with us. We had, I said, five, six cameras, right? And I was on the top of the truck, you know? Yeah. It was after I jumped off, you know, into the bushes and they crashed. Yeah. Know? The car stopped. You know, it was a rehearsal. We didn't show the explosion. The car, the truck stopped. I jumped on, and I had this all pre-planned. It's all pre-planned. I went back on the truck, jumped on the hood. I went uh, like a statue on the truck as he's driving, you know, standing up straight. We got to them. I looked down. I said, 
Richard Norton, Mike Stone, you got that? They go, yeah. I said, now it's your turn. Mm -mm. Because Dudikoff wanted Richard Norton to stunt double him. Right. And that wasn't happening because I was there for that reason. And I said, it's your turn, Richard. And I explained in the book to Richard Norton about Richard Norton that he's a first-class guy because I was having problems with Mike Stone, not Richard Norton. Yeah. It's a class act. And because he was friends with Mike Stone and he came on the airplane and he was great friends with Mike Stone, I had it in my head that that whatever Mike Stone did, Richard Norton was doing part of, right? Yeah. I was so upset at Mike Stone. This is how much class that man Richard Norton has. He came over to me and said, Steve, I just want you to know that whatever you have with Mike Stone, you know, has nothing to do with me, right? I respect you. I know the kind of a person you are. And I, I know the ability you have. You know, I've asked people about you, other martial artists, right? Uh, and 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 I'm on your side, not his side. And he shook hands with me, and we hugged. And he's a first class guy. First guy. He just wanted me to know that, you know, the funny business that Mike Stone was doing, yeah, had to do with him. And I take him. I mean, I have so much respect for that talent and that kind of a person. You know, he's a first class straight shooter. And I just love the guy. You know, but what Mike Stone did and what occurred and what happened and the reason why I had to fire him, uh, you'll have to read in the book. <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna get I'm gonna ask you one last question, right? Yes. I'm gonna go have a ton for you when you come back. I cannot wait to do this again, Steve. And I'm so Pleased that you've uh, you got in touch with me to do this, and um, it's been an absolute joy. But one last question before we we wrap things up, right? And uh, that's about uh, where, where did I put it again? Sorry, get the mind of a goldfish sometimes. Uh, what would you what would you say that is the difference from action cinema these days in comparison to times when cannon were flying high? Too much CGI. <laughs> everybody fakes it you know even if they can do it they fake it too many cables yeah. too many green screens you know too many harnesses you know too many trick ways you know and the people get it you know i i you'll read the book and i explain that i have a quite a bit into doing it the fake way into my yeah book. If you mind me, mind me interjecting, I mentioned this in my review of Ninja 3, is that even if it were real, even if you did it your way, like they did in Revenge of the Ninja, see if it came out just now, I would probably just go, that's fake. Because I know that they have the technology to do it. I already am suspicious of it. I would need to see like a, a documentary into how they made it for me to actually buy it now. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. Sam, Fro who's the uh, bald martial artist, artist, the actor, martial artist, famous guy? Caucasian. Uh, Caucasian. Caucasian. Yeah. Bald, white guy, <laughs> martial artist. Uh, I, have, I don't know. The One. Uh, the movie, The Could, One. Uh, the One or Jet Li? No, no, no. Uh, the American. Or J Jason Statham. Uh, Jason oh, Statham. One. I'll tell you a funny right. story. Revenge of the Ninja, right? You know the uh, the um, uh, sequence where I go through the window of the van? Oh, yeah. Classic. That was all done for real. No cables, no harnesses, no cuts or anything. It was all done for real, right? Sam, Fer uh, uh, about uh, six years ago, Sam Furstenberg sends, sends me a, uh, uh, um, a magazine, right? And, and it's got a, a page on it. And it's Statham doing the same gag. And it's with an interviewer showing Revenge and me and Jason Statham, how he did it with CGI cables and wires and cuts. Right. And, and, and the interview guy, the guy who wrote the, you know, the story, says this is the difference between 
you know, a, a $2 million picture and a Jason Statham picture, a $50 million picture, you know, yeah. whatever. I got exactly what it said, but it complimented us doing it the real way and Jason Statham doing it the fake way. So, you know, you lose a sense of realism for you out yeah. there. No yeah. matter how good it looks, you know, that there's there's an easiness to it. And there's a there's there's a a a way where it's just uh, it's just um, set uh, perfect. Yeah. When you do it, well, for people, you don't know what's going to happen, right? So your whole body language is in a an awareness and a tenseness, knowing that you have to be free and be aware of what could happen. And no, exactly. Happens, when something happens, it's when what's great about things when you do it for real is when something happens that you don't have worked out, a surprise. Which happy happens, accident. A happy accident, which you manage to put in there that looks wonderful, you know, it adds to it because you got out of it. You were good enough and athletic enough to get out of it. And then somebody, after they cut, somebody comes over to you and says, I know you were going to do that. Oh, yeah. I, I <laughs> And I love that. That's why I see ninjas. It happens, oh, I, it happens so often, and and the reason why I never got hurt and I made it look good was 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 because of my athletic ability and because of martial arts. That time and oh, just focus and power of the mind. Well, can I, can I tell you something? When I first became aware of Ninja 3, the domination. It wasn't that long ago. It was like five years ago. And I just, it was because I watched that Canon documentary and it appeared in it. That was when I first heard of the film. And uh, I was like, uh, that's going to be terrible. Just the idea. And the people in the documentary weren't speaking of it very highly, which was a shame. I didn't understand that. Yeah. It right. Was, it, it, Revenge of the Ninja made the, was the biz, p biggest picture Canon ever did. Yeah. Out of all the movies, it it grows the most. Uh, right, Ninja was uh, was the second. Um, uh, they were wonderful, and cool. and uh, the movies that they did and the articles that they did with Menachem and Canon Films, to me, were all terrible because you know they don't tell you the behind the scenes. They don't, you know, they only tell you the seriousness and the uh, the political. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think maybe maybe there's it needs to have a reprisal. But what I was going to say, just on on the note of Ninja Three, was when I when I sit down and watch that, I, I feel it is pure escapism. Whereas if I watch Fast and the Furious Eight or whatever, where they've got cars swinging through trees, and it just feels I, I don't I, I just zone out. I don't feel entertained at all. I feel bored. But when I see you on the top of that. You're a smart no. man because I feel the same way about those Fast and Furious. I saw the first one, I can't see anymore. Yeah, That's but seeing you on top of the police car and Ninja 3, because you're doubling Lucinda, that scene after the graveyard, isn't it? Where she's, where she's killed the cop. <laughs> and uh, That's just, with this, the, you can see the weight of that automobile, you can see the weight of the moves going up the tree, all that kind of stuff is real. You can feel the, the absolute verisimilitude on it, but also, this and is a film of lose. that's what you lose in CGI. And yeah. when we say that, people don't understand because they've never done it physically. Exactly. Well, and what what you know, this film includes ninjas appearing on a golf course, right, at the very beginning of the movie. So it's really asking for you to escape, right? And it and it works that way. It works that way because it's it invites you to come into this crazy world of ninjas on golf courses, but with the realism of the moves, that whole the whole part where he, the, he takes the guy out of the chopper and all that, that was just, honestly, it was jaw-dropping. Oh, jaw-dropping stuff. Thank you, thank you. It was a fun fun time. You know, Ninja 3, The Domination, when I got the script and I, re and I read it, all the dialogue, you know, I, I knew there was a poltergeist thing in it, right? <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know it was going to be shot that way. <laughs> but I will never forget, I, and, and I was a little confused about the story. You know, 
So I, I thought this, I, you know, I had a conversation with Sam Furstenberg, you know, coming from Revenge of the Ninja, and <laughs> this, story wise, script wise, I, I, don't you think we're going downhill instead of uphill as far as, you know, the script? And he goes, no, no, don't worry, that's Schmulek. We haven't talked about Schmulek yet. I love him dearly. But that's yeah. just, don't worry, Steve, everything will be okay. You know, don't worry, you know. So I didn't worry and I just kept to my work, right? And then I'll never forget the day that we started the interior, her, her, uh, her house, her apartment, with all the poltergeist things and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, I started watching that, what Sam Furstenberg had planned, and, and I started to get embarrassed. And I tell the story in the book and I tell it to Sam, you know, and he laughs, you know. And from then on, you know, I was embarrassed of the film, right? I didn't like it because yeah. of the scene. I didn't think it, I go, where are we going here? You know, from ninja to, you know, dominating. I can understand, you know, one body going into another. Yeah. But this scene to me was a bit much. So it really turned me off, right? And then we finished the picture, you know. I wasn't happy with the story from then on there. Before that, I was happy. Because we, we were going in sequence most of the time. But then when the picture got finished, I saw people loved it, you know. Yeah. And then I grew to love it. And even Sam, you know, Sam tells a story. We weren't sure. When we talked together, we weren't sure how it was going to go. Can imagine? Because it does feel like one of those films where they're just throwing everything into the pot. But for somehow it just, the rest of it just tastes amazing. It's yeah. such a, it's, it's, it's honestly one of the most, it's one of those films that if I'm feeling down, Feeling unhappy with myself in some way, that's that's like an antidepressant to me. That that's film. Just, last story, real quick. You know, when she's poltergeist and she spins around like crazy? Yeah. Well, that was supposed to be me. They set it up for me. And when I came on the set to do some other things, they were ready for me to do that. And I came on the set and I go, Shulik, what are you crazy? I'm going to throw my guts out if I do that. You got to bring. You got to bring uh, Lucinda Dickey's uh, uh, second double, which was Miss Dummy. You know her dummy. Yeah, we had a dummy. Uh, that that's who's doing that scene, not me. I yeah. said I, I can't even go on a roller coaster. I could, <laughs> <laughs> could jump, jump. You know, I can jump through a moving truck. You know, can all that stuff, explosions, helicopters, but no roller coasters. Okay, we finish next time. Yeah, yeah, Good. absolutely, Steve. <laughs> it's been an absolute joy to speak to you steve and I, 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 you want to come back and chat again yeah once i've got got that book read absolutely there'll be so many other questions and uh we'll have so many other laps oh time. brilliant I, I, honestly you'll read things there that you'll be so surprised on and let me say to your audience out there everything i write in there is the truth from the Jean LaBelle to the Steven Seagal story, um, then get them getting into a confrontation. Paul from, Verhoeven on T or Total Recall as well, I understand. Yeah, read the book. That's the no. book. <laughs> I was, oh. I'm, I'm the only one who's telling the truth about oh. the LaBelle Steven Seagal story. You know, it's it's amazing how things change and how people want to uh, showboat, uh, they don't tell the real story. But uh, you can read the real story about what happened on, I was there every second. Yeah, just, just so you remember people, it's uh, the book is called Stephen Lambert from the streets of Brooklyn to the halls of Hollywood. It's available on amazon.com. I have put a link in the description there. So yeah, please pick up your copy. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna get, I, I, I won't be able to sleep until I read this book now because he's, Giving me teasing me with all these wee nuggets, you know, Steve James and Michael Dudikoff. I need to know that. I need to. I, I need. I need to know. Anyway, but it's been an thank absolute. Time. Thank you, time, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody out there for listening to us. Harris, yeah, thanks thank you very much. And I'll talk to you after you read the book. Take your time, and uh, we'll enjoy it for the next time. Everybody out there, be safe. Be careful. Yeah. Be safe, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.